January 10, 2023 at 7.03. Let's just go around the table and say our names for the record. So I'll start, we'll go this way, Dick Vandenberg. Carol Gogolinski. Sandy Kuypers. Michael Hutnock. Ryan Hogan. Heather Morin. Lynn Mazzulli. And Howard D'Amico is absent, but maybe he'll come later, so. Mr. Wojcik, you have the floor. That was quick. <laughs> So I've asked Matt to give us kind of an overview of where we are now and then issues or concerns as we start working on our budget for the new fiscal year. Good evening. If I start to say something I've already said to you, please stop me because I lose track sometimes of committees and what I've said to different people. Um, <clears throat> generally, this year is going to be a little bit of an oddity because we are still operating under our existing constraints as a community with a tax base that's almost entirely residential and relatively stable profile when it comes to state aid and state aid is a major part of our budget so that part of the budget remains flat <clears throat> so to the extent that new revenues come in they are raised through the levy at the two and a half percent cap or they are coming in from new growth or other unanticipated I've been talking about Khrushchev all day, so if Khrushchev answers, Carol, <laughs> that phone goes back in time. I walk in, we're talking about Khrushchev. So all day I've had this Yet. image in my mind of Nikita Khrushchev banging his shoe on the rostrum of the United Nations. You're too young to remember it, but I'm not. <laughs> no, for me it was history, Carol. Was, right. Um, forgotten where I was. <laughs> State aid is flat. State, State aid is flat. We can only raise up to our levy cap at two and a half percent. And that is, those are the major boundaries that we still have to deal with for fiscal 24. And we will be making our second and last allocation of free cash to the school teacher contract that we pledged we would make when the contract was settled. So Contrary to what you might expect in an inflationary cycle and in a year when <clears throat> we've been talking about trying to make compensation changes, we have to try to balance the budget with a relatively limited amount of revenue increase over last year's amount of revenue. So it will come down to priorities, priorities that I'll recommend to the select board, the select board will recommend to you. That's the bad news, I guess, is that it's likely to be a very tight budget and we're not, not going to see a lot of northward movement except for those things we prioritize. I prioritize compensation reform because I think we are in a real disadvantage getting people here and keeping people here. And so that has to be addressed in order to stabilize the employment base of the town government because the good news is once we get into fiscal 25, the impact of the economic development should start to filter in. So this year we will feel it because if it hasn't already been received, it will be received soon. We're getting a check for the building permit for the, the warehouse that will be entirely within Douglas. So that's the one project on Gilboa Pond and it's close to a million dollars. But we didn't budget that. That's unanticipated or, well, it wasn't unanticipated, but for purposes of Department of Revenue, Division of Local Services, they would not allow us to budget that because it, there was no guarantee we would receive it this fiscal year. So that's a revenue above and beyond what our revenue budget was. But by year's end, whatever is built will be assessed by the principal assessor and will join the tax base. Now the thing is, once this building starts to get built, it will be going up very, very fast. So it may not be, um, there's nothing in place as of December 31st of 22, but by December 31st of 2023, the building should be largely done. So you will see that new growth. Now we may take another year to catch up, but that's how it's gonna work. 
<clears throat> so we got to bridge ourselves from where we are now to where we are in, uh, in fiscal 25. So when you look for spending changes, they will be in the compensation line. So we're going to try to hold the line on expenses. Uh, we've already sent out some information to department heads. So we've given them the per gallon uh, estimate for diesel, gasoline, and heating fuel because the Energy Information Agency updates their forecasts on a regular basis. So for purposes of calculating the budget, we'll use a number now, and then if the EA, EIA changes their forecast by March, we'll update the figures in the budget just so that we have the most current forecast. But that particular agency is how almost all federal agencies and other agencies budget for energy costs. We already know our electricity costs because we have a contract. So as long as we have a handle on usage, we know what we're going to pay per kilowatt hour for the next two years. So that's, that's actually a known number. The half of the equation is a known number. Um, <clears throat> what is out of our control somewhat is a rather rapid increase in the cost of certain things that we buy outside of energy. Uh, inflation is a, a very strange thing, the way it's playing out in the economy, certain sectors the costs are going up very rapidly and others have been more or less stable. In some cases, like building materials, they've gone up very rapidly and then come back down. And on top of it all, there is um, ample amount of scholarship out there suggesting we will have a recession this year, although that recession may be targeted or limited primarily to the home, the home building sector, uh, you know, residential homes. So, Balancing all of that together, we're really looking at a pretty flat year. Um, I think I've mentioned previously that on the health insurance side, which is one of our cost drivers, we will have an increase, a year over year increase on the renewal due to a single massive claim that has come through, but it came through for the prior fiscal year. So it's a little bit of a timing issue uh, with the institution where the person was submitting bills after the fact. But the good news of that is we have a, th a two year look back when we set rates and it's weighted to be 67% last year and 33% two years ago. So the, the lion's share of the negative impact of that large claim will only be weighted at the 33% level, not the 67% level, because that claim is termed, which is a nice way of saying they're not with us anymore. Uh, they're not in our group anymore. So can I'm going to budget. Yeah, can go ahead. Can I ask a question, Matt? So when we um, do insurance, um, do we shop around for different vendors or is it for municipalities and so on? Is it kind of a limited? So no, for health insurance, we're self-insured. Okay. Self -insured. That's right. Okay. So that's why we have all this information already because we've already seen the claim and we've seen how it yep. played out. The percentage increase? So I'm going to I'm going to budget a 4%, um, which is kind of bearish. Our consultant tells us that it may not be that high, it may be closer to 3. But we've averaged about a little bit less than 2.5% for the last four years. So this is a might be the kind of adjustment we have to make because of that. There's also a trend. It's only 6% of the trust fund's budget, but it does have an impact. The reinsurance business is passing on huge premium increases into the market this year. So a lot of self-insured groups are seeing their, their premiums for stop loss uh, go through the roof. We're a little bit bigger group. Uh, we have a little bit more stability. We've had rate caps for the last couple of years. So we're optimistic that we'll be able to negotiate a good deal. Um, that's health insurance. Now, you already heard from the pension fund. You know what they're looking for. This is one of those things I've had. I keep getting on my soapbox about this group. But there will be a meeting from the numbers folks at the pension fund with our treasurers and finance, uh, you know, town accountants, <laughs> finance directors from the region to discuss the upside downside of a 2% COLA that the board, pension board, has voted to support. But only the, is it two thirds? It, it's a, it's a, a large majority of the members have to vote in favor 
of that COLA for it to go through, because it has to go through for the entire regional pension fund. 2% doesn't sound like much. Even Social Security is coming through with a bigger COLA for, the, for its covered retirees. But that's not what we're doing. We have a dangerously or critically underfunded pension fund. And the question isn't whether we have sympathy for people who are drawing against that fund. It's whether or not the integrity of the fund as a financial entity can be sustained. There are a lot of unanswered questions. Is that 2% going to go to the base? Is that 2% going to be a multi-year commitment of 2% year over year? Um, <clears throat> but typically, when you're only 43% funded or whatever it is, it's about 43%. The last thing you do is add additional yearly expenses that you have to meet. So when we did pension fund in Rhode Island, those funds that were that critically underfunded, you saw COLA reductions, you saw benefit reductions. Those things aren't possible in Massachusetts, but that doesn't mean that the financial integrity is any different. It's about the same. It takes a really long time for local assessments to catch up with the unfunded liability and adding a COLA to it just pushes that time horizon out even further. Um, knock on wood, right? Our property casualty insurance has been another one of those dynamic growth accounts that we don't usually find out what our premium is going to be until really late in the budget process. In fact, last year I think we did our best to arrive at a number we thought we could defend, but if we didn't actually get the renewal until after town meeting, mm -hmm. which is really aggravating. Everybody complains about it every year. Maya doesn't do a better job of any given year of, of answering those complaints. Um, but so far this year, we have not had any major claims. Um, that look back goes deeper into the past. It takes quite a few years to get past a bad claim, and we do have that bad claim in our history of the fuel spill in the basement here, um, which is unfortunate. So we're going to look at another 10 to 12 percent as the starting out of the gate increase in property casualty insurance. Um, those are most of the major categories. We don't have any union uh, agreements up this year. They will be up next year. So they are in the last year uh, of their contracts. We have a few contract renewals this year on the staff side. Um, my contract is up. The fire chief's has got another year and his, I think maybe it's the police chief that will be up soon, but there's a few, few of those out there too. Um, going back to the allocation of free cash to the school department for their labor agreement. Uh, the number is about half of what it was last year. So basically, two thirds of the contribution came in the first year, and then the other third will come in the second year of the contract. So that's, um, we pretty much, when we looked at the free cash expenditures, we made sure we rolled over enough money to, to satisfy our, our commitment to the school committee to fund that. Um, I've begun to do an analysis and are still trying to get everybody used to the fact that we're not just doing Zoom meetings in here, we're actually trying to facilitate meetings. So if that computer is tied up with Zoom, it makes it harder for me to get my stuff. So now, now the whiteboard, the big board, can be shared to the remote meeting participants. The problem is I can't sit here and scroll through my document the way I wanted to, unless I planned ahead and I didn't. But <clears throat> one of the things I'm very focused on is that we said, we being the select board and members of the administration that implement the budget, come up with the budget, we said that the override period was basically this five years. So from the time that the override passed, we were looking for the resources generated by that to at a minimum, sustain the town for five years and make it so that free cash did not need to be used for operations. I think we've beaten that, but now the question to answer is, well, how do we allocate all the funds? So once the funds were raised by the override, where is all that new spending gone? Um, and 
I have a nice slide that shows that. Um, but more than 50% of it has gone to education. So to the Douglas Public Schools, Blackstone Valley Tech, Norfolk Aggie, and school bus transportation have taken up about 53% of all the new funds raised. So I'm considering any new fund to be any additional dollar over the previous year. Just add it up over time. So that the base year is fiscal 2017. Just look at every year versus the level in 2017. That was a new dollar you didn't have in 2017. So where did all that money go? It's not just from the override because there's a built-in two and a half that's in there as well. But where did it all go? So 53% went to education. Uh, about another quarter of it went to pensions, health insurance, property insurance. So those quote unquote fixed costs of the entire town government. And the municipal departments only got about 24% of all that money. And then when you peel the onion back another layer, so within the municipal departments, where was that money allocated? It was no surprise because so much of our town government is public safety, it would stands to reason that public safety did walk away with the largest dollar amounts, and in some cases, some of the larger percentage increases. But there are a few things in there that are not so obvious to, especially a finance committee, because you're not part of the day-to-day -day operation of town government. But one of the largest percentage increases and also one of the largest dollar increases was information <laughs> technology. So we started with what was really an old network that was actually owned by the cable company. So it was a spectrum enterprise network package that the town had bought and was implemented. I always point to the IT room because it's right there. It's kind of like a habit. But so it was all in that room, but we didn't even own our servers and our routers and everything else. Spectrum owned them. And what the town had bought a number of services because that's a corporate package, the Spectrum Enterprise, like voicemail and voice over internet protocol and stuff that we never used because we weren't set up to use it. So it really wasn't the best deal. It was a patch that got the town through a few years. But what we've done in the last five years, almost six years now, is completely built the town's own information technology network entirely from scratch relying on the expertise of our guys to you know, get better deals and to not use extra fancy anything. We just use basic Sherman tanks, right? <laughs> they drive forward, they're not that fast, they can take a beating. And that was really what we designed our IT network to be, just something that would survive power failures and that would be redundant, would back up to the cloud rather than here and just make it work and make it secure. But that has cost some money, and we've also upgraded. And at the same time, the industry is changing. So remember, we all used to go to the store and buy CDs with uh, our office software on it and our operating system. And if you ever tried to upgrade your tower, you probably were unsuccessful. I know I was. I bought a tower foolishly that had Millennium Edition, and I tried to upgrade it to whatever that was, Windows. 2000 or whatever the next thing was, and it didn't work. It didn't work at all. Um, we don't do that anymore. We subscribe to Microsoft 365. We pay a fee. Every single user that we have, we pay a fee for the, the suite of services that they have access to. So now we're more dependent on who our users are than we are on you know buying new towers and buying new uh, CDs. <clears throat> but all of those changes. You know, over the course of about five years, the total increase in the IT budget, this is not what we're spending every year. It's the total amount of money we spent over five years. It's a little over $300,000. So that gives you a sense. You know, it's not the most expensive thing in the world. It's about half of the what we increased police and fire salaries by, but it's still a substantial increase. Um, offsetting that, there have been some savings um, that are permanent. So. Converting the town street lights over from incandescent and fluorescent fixtures to LED fixtures has actually had a pretty substantial savings for the town over the course of about five years. It saved us about $150,000 total. Um, we also carry in our budget veterans benefits and veteran services. And it is unfortunate but true that the greatest generation has 
begun to pass away. And the total number of veterans that are now being supported by the programs that we carry in our budget has gone down drastically. So there are far fewer beneficiaries. And um, <clears throat> so that's just not showing up in our budget anymore. So it's not, not there. Um, so overall, um, the financial picture of the town as a result of the override also reflects our ability to generate a certain amount or to sustain a certain amount of free cash every year increasing and being used. So while it's not <coughs> accruing and making our unrestricted fund balance look nice, great, big, juicy, fat thing, um, we're spending it because we have to, because just to operate, to buy the vehicles and to fix the buildings, there was a certain amount of deferred maintenance that had started to pile up and we needed to catch up with some of that. So we're turning the corner this year really, once we finish the backup power project here and the backup power project the fire department and if it ever happens, I'm gonna knock on wood. I'm told that it's gonna happen by the end of this month when we finish the public safety radio project as well. We'll have a number of more modern assets that the town has invested a lot of money in that greatly enhance our ability to provide services to folks. So um, that backdrop informs, you know, my <coughs> say to my department heads, you gotta grin and bear it for one more year. We're just gonna make this work. And in some cases it may be difficult to do. Uh, one of the line items that has been the strongest gainer over the past five years has been the expenses of the fire and ambulance department. And part of that's because Simultaneous with the override, there was a conversion of that department from a call department to a full-time advanced uh, life support ambulance service, fire and ambulance service. It's a challenge to do. It is very hard to find people and hard to retain people in the competitive environment we're in. But it was also, it's just a completely different funding structure. You know, when it's call, they're coming, they are hopping on the equipment, they have bare bones stuff, you know, their job is to get you to, to someone else who can help you. And now we're doing a lot more, right? So we're running two ambulances on the road. We have paramedics on every shift, at least we're trying to have one paramedic on every shift. And that run rate, that extra fuel, being in the station, having the lights on, having the heat on, doing all the things that you do in a building 24 seven that you didn't occupy in the past, except during the day, when Chief Gagnier and maybe a lieutenant was the only two people in the building, it's just different. That expense, we, we've we've closed the gap considerably, but we're still short. Um, I'm going to stop there and see if anybody has any questions because that was a pretty broad overview. So I have a couple, Matt. Um, so of the main legs of income that we get every year, as we look ahead, any major changes in any of those legs in terms of uh, percentage up or down that you anticipate? Or is it going to be pretty predictable at this point? The decisions that this town will have to make going forward will revolve around how to absorb new growth and how much of the levy cap you're going to spend up to. Okay. Because unused levy you don't get another bite at that apple. You have to decide you know, how much of that you actually want to use and how much of it you want to leave unused for the benefit of the taxpayer who's looking for relief from all this economic development. Uh, the two, those are two, I don't want to call them competing, but they are inversely related impulses. They can be balanced in a way that people will support and that's finding that, that sweet spot. Uh, clearly, when you start putting up lots of large buildings and you may have several hundreds, <coughs> if not a couple thousand people <coughs> working in those buildings, quite possibly 24-7, you are actually increasing the effective population of the town. The number of people who can hurt themselves, the number of people who can have any kind of health event in the town has will, will increase very suddenly and very quickly. So. Um, <clears throat> there's balancing those needs and being able to staff properly against, you know, wanting to make major capital investments and, and, and then in some cases, you know, save money and keep 
keep taxes stable. Um, I think the the <coughs> outlook on the horizon now is is quite a bit different today than it was even a year ago. Because a year ago we didn't know that maybe it was more like a year and a half ago we didn't know that pine sand and gravel was going to sell the, their their land and that the other investors there were also going to sell. So they, they've all gotten together, uh, Mrs. Bedoyan and the DeVries Corporation and Pine Sand and Gravel and that, there's a, there's a purchase and sales agreement that's been executed. The same developer that's building the warehouse in the old McIntyre pit is the successful suitor for the pine pit. That's a much bigger property, right? So. If you want to watch miracles, Carol will laugh. <laughs> when you want to watch miracles, look how fast that hill is going to come down. It's gone now. It's gone now. You don't realize it's what you see as a face. It's just, so that's why it's going to be so fast, Carol. It's just going to go goof. And you're going to be yeah. looking at, not level, but you're going to be looking at a much more gradual slope than you've ever thought you'd see there. That's a prime development site. Think about everything that's happening there, right? It's all been leveled off. It's right next to 146, and we just spent all this money to get water, sewer, and gas at the end of the driveway. So that's a pretty significant development that will make the McIntyre development seem like small potatoes by the time it's done. That's the good news. It's all coming at once, though, so there's that, you know, how much are we going to be able to absorb? But you're talking about the tax base of the town changing by 20%. That's a really, that nobody, only small towns get that kind of experience, mm -hmm. yeah. right? So. And how about um, the various department heads, Matt, are they getting the, the sense that it's going to be kind of a tight budget for this year in terms of their? I've been waving that flag for a couple of weeks now. Okay. I don't know how effective I've been. <laughs> <laughs> because I can't remember what I did three weeks ago. I was I think so you, sick. <laughs> I think a year ago the sense was more. Uh, we thought all of this would materialize this year, and that so, we would be looking at this. Yeah. This would be the first year yeah. of the happy times are, are here again kind of thing. But no. We're not here yet. Nope. So leaner and meaner in this year's budget. Then. <clears throat> have to maintain focus and, and and try to find some efficiencies where we can. But it's, I think it's incumbent on my office, Gene's office, and others not to overpromise, especially the select board, not to overpromise to anyone that this is a year we're going to battle through and we can talk about priorities next year. Um, now that we have this completely non local bucket of ARPA funds that we can spend this year spending because we have to get that money out the door. Is that coming to an end? No, December 2024, 20, right? So we're really two full years away, but just think about the way we operate. It's municipal government. It works about like molasses on a cold day. So you got to procure, you got to advertise. After you advertise, you have to negotiate and then line everybody up and get the project started. As long as you sign a contract by December 31st, 2024, the funds are considered obligated and they won't be taken back by the feds. Um, you gotta start that ball we're going to start that ball rolling because if you're going to put pipes in the ground, for instance, you need to do the engineering. Yep. And the engineering will take several months. Yep. So a lot of this stuff is 12-month, 18-month burn once the decision is made. So I think I wrote my first memo on this topic back in May. So we're seven months into this. And a, a little bit of the money's been decided on, but not much of it. You know, are there certain things that we can only use that for? It's gotten a little, a lot less restrictive than it, than it was. When it first came out, uh, Mr. Chairman, Carol's question was warranted because we were limited to like water, sewer, yeah. and things that we could identify were clearly arising from the pandemic. Right. I think enough people howled about how impossible that was. Yeah. And then everybody bought all the water pipe there was to be had in the universe. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? And then you might be faster to make it yourself than to try to find it and buy it. Um, so that was sort of an epic fail. So now they recharacterized that smaller communities could just consider the money as revenue replacement. And instead of being 
all these things you can't do and a narrow focus that you can do, it's switched completely. There's a narrow set of things you can't do and almost everything else you can do. You can't build a building. Okay. You can't use it for debt service or for pension funds. Okay. And oddly enough, if you're going to issue premium pay, you cannot pay anyone who did not come to work during the pandemic premium pay if they stayed at home. You can do other things. Yep. And we may do some of that for one particular employee who had to work from home. Yeah. But other than that, everything else is fair game. So can we buy police cruisers? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Now roads. Look for fire trucks. <laughs> roads, well, you know, any vehicle, right? Uh, roads, we've, we've been back and forth with our consultant on whether or not that's considered a permissible use. Um, it would, it seems as if repairs may be okay. Building a brand new road from scratch, digging it into the woods, probably not. Um, so, so those major capital projects. When you say repair, are you talking repaving or pothole patches? Repaving where it's warranted. You know, if you've got a, like we we have a pavement the study. Warranted. We have a <laughs> pavement study. Yeah, but you're gonna you're gonna prioritize by a number of factors, including the, the deterioration plus the amount of usage it gets. Right. Um, I'm hopeful this year that the capital budget will reflect the same decision that was made last year, which is that the town would match its chapter 90 funds dollar for dollar, which would give the highway department uh, about 750 or almost 800, about, let's call it $750,000 to pay. And that we would use ARPA funds for something different. So if there's a whole list that we've put together um, <clears throat> on the administration side and asked the select board to make a decision about. And that includes any water project that the water department would not be able to generate enough funding on their own or even grant funding on their own to do, but that needs to be done in order to facilitate better use of town assets and a better quality of service for the, for the entire town. So the way, at the present time, the way the decision has been set up is you've got two competing large projects. You can only have enough, you only have enough funds to do one of those two. And once you pick one, that's a little bit more than half of your ARPA funds. The rest you can do a series of smaller projects. So the two competing projects are, when the, on the water side, to run water up Depot Street and replace the really ancient pipe that is under Depot Street, and then go through a little bit of the woods and loop the service over to Maple, which would have a few different benefits to it. One is right now it's a dead end line, so every time there's any kind of water break or anything that happens on Main Street, this dead end line gets reversed and all that tuberculation, all that rust and other nasty, whatever it is, comes out of people's faucets for a while. These pipes under here are 1900, 1920 vintage, so they're very old. But the primary benefit of that would be if we're gonna dig a water line in front of this building, we should change the nature of the water service into the municipal center. So right now we have both fire suppression and domestic service. It's a big no-no coming off one pipe and we only sprinkle the first floor. If we had better water service and we separated fire from domestic service in this building, we would have the ability to sprinkle the second floor and make use of that space, potentially make better use of the whole building to give the police more space and still comply with both the fire code and the ADA because the building is ADA accessible. We have the elevator in the wing. So <clears throat> we would never do that. In a million years, I don't think that would pass the capital process. It's just too expensive. It doesn't benefit enough things. Uh, the other potential water project, we have a, a run of pipe pretty much from the top of the hill, uh, call it Franklin Street, uh, kind of really up towards where the GBI uh, model buildings are all parked there. And 
all the way down to the bottom of that hill. Uh, going which direction? Going towards the common. So now you're you're in front of the old Buckeye property and you're starting to go up uh, to the old common. That run of pipe breaks a lot. And um, it's really problematic because we have a pump station there on that main street that moves water from the Church Street water tower into the system. So we need that the integrity of that pipe to be upgraded. Mm -hmm. If we did that and we ran a sewer pipe next to it at the same time, we might be able to hook up the town buildings and anything that family convenience decides to do or not do, we could put them on both town water and town sewer and you know, actually make it more developable uh, on a go forward basis. So it's one or the other, they can't do both. And then the other projects kind of fall into line, much lower amounts. Um, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning for the fire station, which is badly needed. Um, I'm going to forget every single last project that we have requested. But like the town highway uh, The barn. town highway barn, uh, we've encumbered funds for the design. So, so there's a designer RFQ that is out right now for a house doctor type relationship with a design firm to first and foremost bring us to the point of conceptual design by town meeting in November. So the idea would be to explore the various town lots that we could use because we really don't want to have to purchase real estate if we can avoid it. See where it would be feasible to put a highway barn, figure out the footprint of the thing and the cost of it in a conceptual way and go to town meeting and try to and try to get the funds approved to go to bond and, and actually build it. Mm -hmm. But I want that same firm to also be engaged with us on police and fire needs because we've had the subcommittee that looked at that and then we had the building facilities committee has looked at that and how to better utilize our existing buildings and also to just quite frankly handicap it. Doesn't make any sense at all to invest any more money into some of our older buildings, given their state? Or would it be more cost efficient for taxpayers to look at other forms of public? I, I think we've kind of, the, the horse has left the barn on that in the sense that this is a really great building here. So to not utilize it to its full potential is kind of a bad use of asset. The fire station is relatively new. It's 20 years old, yeah. but it was built in a way that allowed for expansion, because it's kind of kitty-cornered in its lot. And um, while it needs it to be modernized and updated, because it was built for a specific purpose, it was built to be a call fire department building, you could still increase the footprint with brand new addition and save actually probably quite a bit of money not having to start from scratch. So, But I want the same firm involved with all of those things as I want them to understand the town and the dynamics of the town and how all the assets work. I, I don't like the idea of hiring three or four different design firms based on competition over time and they ignore each other's work and they're all trying to build a Taj Mahal because they're looking for that fancy picture for their next brochure for their next job. <laughs> I want them to be committed to us. The other thing that we're encountering in the marketplace, there's a shortage of everybody, and including engineers and architects. And if we want to build a relationship, we've got to look at it in terms of long term, because to have somebody come in and do a highway barn for you, you're not going to get a competition. You're probably going to get one or two firms that want to do it because they're doing it now. And that's not a good spot to be in to only have two bidders. I'd rather have somebody say, well, that's a pretty good relationship. The town's gonna keep us around for three or four projects. Yeah, we'll bid on that. We might not have done it for one, but we'll bid on it for three or four. That's what I'm hoping anyway. Okay. That was a long-winded answer yeah. to your question about the highway barn, but there's a lot going on with that, so. Anybody questions for Matt on either where we are now or going forward as we get working on the budget? Specific, conceptual, anybody? Gene, do you have any um, 
comments for us as we are at this stage in the game in terms of moving forward and issues that you're concerned about? Not at this time. Okay. They'll come up as needed, right? As needed, yes. So Matt, the, uh, <clears throat> you mentioned December of 2024 is a deadline for the ARPA money, is that right? And most of it is available yet? So um, is there kind of a game plan for how to go through the next year and a half to start identifying where we can you said you wrote a memo recently and so, so we've done actually quite a bit of exploration <coughs> of these different topics um, it's all coming back to me now the phone system here and in the school department uh, building security system for the school department I'm building security at the fire station uh, cruiser we, had, we were able to take the bus off because the town meeting decided to fund the bus, so that's off the list. Uh, fire department. That's a proposal. It's not a... So that, those are all the proposals. So that we've put numbers next to each of these things so that the board will know what it's deciding, what it will have left. Um, it, it's entirely up to the select board what they want, how fast they're going to move and what they're going to do. Um, I'm anxious to get it started, though, because once once we get past that, we'll get a whole bunch of other things that we need to do. So I don't want it all to land on, on our plates all at once. I'd rather, there's a window of opportunity here. It's going to be a lean year on the operating side. Let's do the grant-funded capital side as quickly as we can get it done. Plus, with inflation, the longer we park money, we lose value. All right, anybody else? Uh, comments or questions for Mr. Wojcik? All right, thank you, Pat. Do you want to talk about timing? Because it might be, sure. might be timely to talk about timing. Okay. Um, your next meeting, so today is the 10th. Are you scheduled to meet the 20th? 24th, yeah. So I will be out of town from the 19th to the 29th. Um, so if you get started with hearing from different departments or whatnot, you might want to go with, a, with something that's a little bit easier and isn't going to be a huge demand on dollars, but that you still might want to talk to. Um, <clears throat> I always try to set these ambitious goals, then it gets really hard to do because major numbers come in too late in the process. You know, really our goal is to fully wrap up a budget for presentation to the Finance Committee uh, in early March, which doesn't actually leave that much time, right? So it really leaves February, and I have to do my process. So I'm looking for the first week, maybe I can meet up with a couple of department heads before I leave next Friday. Uh, but for the most part, the budget process will be early February. Now, I said it's tight, so I don't really want to get into that whole paperclip counting conversation because I don't know outside of comp. I'm not sure what there is to talk about. However, um, it's, an, it's a good opportunity to meet with each department head individually and probably do more than just the budget, do their evals and everything else. But I would like to do that really the first two or three weeks of February, and I would try to give you two or three sessions of the Finance Committee to at least have a submission uh, in draft form, and then your action item would be the first week of March. Um, you like to wrap up first week of April, correct? Well, what's the timing between um, town meeting stuff has to get published? Town meeting is very early this year. May 1, then, yeah. And so. What are those timelines, Gene? When does the warrant have to be published? How many weeks before weeks. the thing and all that? So we usually are finished by that first, second week of April. For you to make your comments, it has to allow a certain number of days to go to the printer. So I would look at, because May 1st, 
this is the earliest it could possibly be. I'm probably looking at that first week of April to have you guys have your public hearing. And Would that be our last meeting before stuff got published then? Pretty close. So, so April, so April 11 is the second yeah, Tuesday of April. That's too late. Probably. That's too late. So would April 4 be our last meeting then? Yeah. Which is an off week for you? It's the first like, Tuesday, yeah. yeah. It's going to conflict with the selectmen, wasn't it? I'm sorry? Isn't that going to conflict with the selectmen? We'd have to use the other room. I think we've gotten into this pattern now where the Finance Committee, towards the end of your process, you meet every week mm -hmm. for at least two weeks, sometimes three. Seems like. And there's usually at least one conflict with a select board meeting. But I think last year was two, two or three. Matt, when did you say you're going to be gone? Uh, the 19th through the 29th. Of January. Yeah. Which? Mark your calendars. It's probably when you'll get two feet of snow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not Either on the 19th or the 29th, because it's not oh, just you no. that will suffer. I will suffer sure. trying to get out of here and get back. Um, yeah. Getting out. We we feel better about we, getting back, and you can't get back. Yeah. That's yeah. So, Gene, should we pencil in March 21 for a meeting? You think? I probably would. Yes. So if we went. <laughs> March 14, 21, 28. And April 4? Yeah. I think that's kind of what we did last year, though, wasn't it? No. <laughs> Not four weeks in a row, yeah. yeah. In the past, we doubled and tripled up when we've had snow. That's true. Too. early parts of January, February schedule. Mm -hmm. But I think in the past, we've hit the back to backs when we put the last meeting and then the, the pub public hearing meeting, together. Yeah. Public hearing, back to back. But I don't, I don't see why we'd have to go beyond March 14, March 28, April 4. You can pencil that in, change it if we get snow, or change it if there's other things. Well, I'm going to put March 21 question mark, and we'll try not to. Right. And we'll, and April 4 will be our last one then. So well, look at April 4. I'll, I'll go and review the calendar with <coughs> to see if we can go the 11th. Because that may give us the fourth if we needed to have. It's really going to depend on how you want the budget season to go. Do you want to meet with all the departments? Are you calling them all in? Um, you know, that's going to determine how many meetings you actually need. Right. And the school department is usually kind of by itself, right? The school department, and BBT, um, they're usually scheduled at the beginning of March. Okay. So they would probably be a March fourteenth meeting. Okay, but. Do we normally do others besides the school department, or the school department usually takes a big chunk of time? So for I that evening, it's just the two BBT and, and the okay. school department. Okay. Okay. So Matt, um, so I know there's always the thought that let's just do this department by department because that's how the budget is organized. Yeah. I actually think the issues are different this year. You might want to think of it in different kinds of buckets. You might want to think of it in terms of compensation reform. You know. Um, the major accounts, so insurance and retirement, and drill down on that. They probably have a more productive conversation looking at it in terms of activity code and function than this department, that department. Um, I think that's definitely a useful tool for digging into the budget, but there are times where it just does become sort of a, um, a repetitive march. Year after year after year, you hear the same, same thing over and over again. I think the, the exception might be fire and ambulance just because we're continuing to develop that budget. But highway, John's only going to tell you so much mm -hmm. new every year and put them on the spot. But if, you, if we have a, a meeting that's talking about compensation reform, then you can have multiple department heads here that have staff that work on the comp table to hear the conversation. And that might so what would those categories be then if we wanted to go Category. So non-union, non-union, non-contracted <clears throat> compensation. So the comp table. And it may have been a long time since we've done anything other than simply point to it and say, oh, there it is. And we're going to put this position on here because we either changed the definition of it or we want to move it from one place to another. I, I think it is appropriate 
for everyone to take a step back and say, well, how does this work? How have we run the compensation system for the town of Douglas for the last 15, 20 years, and why does it need to be changed? That, that conversation, it's a pretty heady conversation, and it's going to be the lion's share of the dollar increase in the budget. Aren't you the star of that show, though? What's your budget? I understand, but that's not department heads giving a breakdown of compensation provisions within the When I talk about it, though, it's at the 50,000 foot level. What I think people need to hear, especially those people who will be voting at town meeting, is what it means to the departments and the department heads maintaining morale, having opportunity for people to earn promotions, and what it's like to recruit people into each specific function. That conversation I have found incredibly valuable to have as I go through my process. Um, because completely different skill sets. You know, we're, we're hiring people that we expect to have financial sector and financial background and acumen on the one hand. On the other hand, we're looking for people who can run a front end loader and drive a, CD, a truck that requires a CDL. Different competitive dynamics comes to the same conclusion but there's still a story, there's still a journey to get to why it is that we need to do the things that we're I, recommending. I kind of feel the town drops the ball on uh, marketing itself. And I think, you know, they, they don't, uh, when they're trying to, to get out there and hire people, they don't tell them the benefits, the very good benefits there to be in the municipal work or over working uh, out in the private sector or I think most I mean, what's the percentage of people who have their own businesses even? Uh, I think they, they don't market the advantages that you can get when you work for a town. Uh, you know, the hours that you work, uh, the, the, the health benefits that you get, uh, the uh, pensions especially, that's fantastic. Anybody's looked at their 401ks and stuff and they realize that this is a guaranteed pension. Man, that's damn good stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think those are the things that should be marketed. And then from the other point of view, too, is, you know, why don't we put something in the budget, like when someone's leaving? We knew that assessor was leaving for a year. Why didn't we have something in the budget where we could hire somebody, get somebody in here to work along with her and learn the job? We did do that. Yeah, they did. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, it's, then how come we had to get that guy, how come we, we had to get somebody to come in in, um, uh, didn't we have to hire an outside assessing form firm? We, we did, it? but that was because we didn't, we did recruit, we did advertise, we did budget for that, for both the principal assessor as well as the staff person, um, because you have the institutional knowledge in those positions. Um, unfortunately, the, as Matt alluded to, Come on. Where, where do you advertise this? Because I never saw any of those ads. Anybody else see any? Where do you, where do you advertise? We advertise where people who do that job are well, likely to read, to not you. We advertise from places to people who don't do that job. No, you can't you know? do that. You I want mean, skill I never heard it. No, but an assessor, there's a whole bunch of certifications that they need to have. So it, if you don't currently work in the public sector, you're unlikely to be qualified. So there was advertised on the Assessors Association website. It was advertised in the Massachusetts Municipal Association website and in their newsletter. You put the job in the paper, you get lots of Indeed and ZipRecruiter and other applications from people who have absolutely no idea. They're just clicking. It's, it's sending a lot of dross that you, you filter through. And in the end, it wasn't advertising that has gotten any of our people here. How about, like, it was word of mouth through networking that has gotten every single one of these positions filled. How about people who were already working in there? I mean, I, I think the lady who, who ended up being, uh, you know, who retired, she, I think, worked her way up through the system, didn't she? Beth, what? is that her Beth name? Beth. Yeah, she right. did. You she can do it. She worked her way up through the system. Because um, I think before that, uh, it was your aunt that was the assessor. Yeah. She, I think, worked her way up through the system as well. It, it's always the goal, Carol, that people who are working as the assistant in that department go get the classes, learn what they need to, and take on greater and greater responsibility with the passage of time. But in that office, particular office, both the staff person 
and the principal assessor retired within the same year. So we, we hired people, like I said, through word of mouth. And, and we're fortunate to get qualified people. Yeah. Yep. Word of mouth in the industry or word of mouth in the community? Networking in the, in, in, in the profession. In the industry. Okay. Yeah. But you know, are you out there, are these towns out there just cannibalizing each other? Yes. yes. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the market. There, people are going where the buck is, and we can't pay. We're not competitive. Well, we, we've been a little bit more competitive. I'll tell you what we're getting. We're getting highly qualified people who are leaving. Um, not to cast aspersions on any of my colleagues, but they're leaving dysfunctional places to come here and work. Or they left a dysfunctional place for a little while and then found out about an opportunity here and then came here. But the people that we've been getting have been experienced people who have worked in other Blackstone Valley towns up till they're higher here. But that has largely been through personal connections that our staff here has outside of this building, but within their profession. You gotta remember, we all, at different levels, engage our peers from other towns on a regular basis. We have professional development meetings, we have briefings and all kinds of phone calls with all kinds of state officials where everybody's eyeballing each other and getting a, a sense of what's going on in their towns. And that's where you find opportunities most of the time to hire folks. Um, but really between Eve Tapper, who you may recall was our interim planner, she was from Newton. Mm -hmm. She got all of our candidates, eventually, the person who was hired. Uh, it was all networking through Eve. Uh, and Cheryl Vage has done a, a lot of uh, outreach to people because she's been around her profession. So. so Matt, are you are you recommending then that as we get ready to do the budget work that we do, that we don't just have a parade of department heads through, but we take another approach? Yeah, because I think that will be the most efficient use of your time. If we look at the number of opportunities for you to have a meeting that doesn't go so deep into the night that people lose interest, yeah. then you should attack the topics that are, are associated with the biggest dollar amounts. In which, you know, frankly, if you talk about comp reform, that affects every single department. Because there are non-union non-contracted staff in almost every department. So let's say you're the police chief and you're getting ready for your annual presentation to the finance committee about what you've done every year. Would we not have the police chief come? Or we would, but it would be to talk about different categories. I mean, how would you set it up? Once he's here, you can ask him anything you want. Yeah. So he should always come with his budget. But okay. the focus of the conversation might be dispatch. They've organized the union, but we haven't started a talk yet. So I don't know where we stand with it. But he's, he can talk about his dispatch. He can talk about his expense account. Because everything else is already settled. He's already in a labor contract. So, and we know who's, who's on his roster. So we know exactly what it's going to cost. And you're bound to pay it because you signed the contract and ratified it. So there's nothing to talk about there except to look at the dollar amount and say, yep, that's the right dollar amount. But in terms of what is it that's being recommended for change, what we'd be recommending this year is comp table change and how we organize uh, expenses and how we're going to get through the year. Uh, one of the uh, another moving part for, for a lot of us is how much will we spend, should we spend, uh, giving people opportunities to improve themselves in their position. So if this is going to be a vehicle for retention, does our existing education and training budget support what it is that we're trying to do? So I'd, I'd like to get people's opinion on that. Um, so let's say we have the fire chief in front of us or the police chief or the superintendent. Do you want to go through all the detail of how much new holsters cost or do you want to just have that printed and able for you to look at but then 
when the person is in front of us be more cosmic somehow. Any, any thoughts on that? Anybody? Well, I think what a, because I'm not sure what we should even be asking about. If, if this compensation thing is, is such a big important thing, I'd like to get an idea of what positions are the non-union, non-contract positions. So, I don't know, I mean, some of them are in the union, so I don't know who's in the union and who's not in the union. Evidently, it appears that maybe the dispatchers are not in the union with the fire department, but the, but the firefighters are, or I don't know. And that's so I why I think it's important. Who so is, who, who, who's in the union and who's not in the union? Who's under contract and who's not under contract? What positions? Not, not necessarily the name of the people, right. but the positions. So is there any way we can get that information? No, you have to have that information. And that, that's kind of my point. That basic education as to what it is that we're talking about is important for everybody to know which positions, what's the history, and we can provide our benchmarks so whether people get paid in other towns of a similar size. Those are all considerations that will probably be bandied about on the floor of town meeting. I'd rather have the finance committee leading that discussion and be the well-informed source of, because you're the investigatory arm of town meeting. You're supposed to be asking these questions. Um, rather than have it be almost a unilateral presentation from yeah. the town administrator and the finance director on it, it, if you decide to support it, it should be something that you feel you know enough about to support. Uh, Mr. Chairman, to answer Carol's question, the town hall staff is non-union. Uh, up until recently, the dispatchers in the fire department were non-union. We have a clerk uh, in the fire department who's not in any union, and we have the entire highway department is not unionized, neither the clerk nor the public uh, highway workers. And then we have a subset of department heads that are not authorized to have a contract. So the Massachusetts general laws specifically lays out what positions are allowed to have an employment contract with the municipality. And it's not every department head is on that list. So the highway superintendent, not eligible. Um, he's not contracted? He's not in contract. He's on the compensation table. Yeah. Uh, the library director, the senior citizen outreach coordinator, adult social center director, so Patrice's position is not under contract. Those are all on the compensation table. The building commissioner, uh, the community development director, none of those people have contracts. And then Gene's entire department with the exception of Gene. So the town treasurer, the treasurer collector, the uh, all of the assistants in that area, the assistant that floats back and forth with the town clerk's office, none of these people have contracts. So can, can we kind of get a list of that? Yes, we we'll get a list. Good. Could, could it be emailed to us instead of waiting for the next meeting or? We can post know. it as soon as, I mean, I already have I it, mean, I so. know we, you know, all it's open, open, whatever you call it, meeting stuff. I don't want to ask for something we're not supposed to be asking. Oh, no, you can, that's. Sandy, do you have a question? Do we have like an internship program at all? Like that we would talk to the high school students about seeing if they would have any interest in coming into the town? And so there's, we do a little bit of seasonal work at the highway department. Um, and we have an intern sort of carve out there for BVT. Last year we didn't get any application. But um, in terms of other town functions, no. Um, my profession is deeply involved with Suffolk University and trying to inspire MPA students to get involved in, to be an assistant town administrator or an HR director and, and you know, aspire to the job. You know, it's modestly successful. But if you're, if you're a student, you're going to school in Suffolk, at yeah. Suffolk. How far out are you willing to go? Mm -hmm. So the, the, the collar communities get pretty good uptake, but we don't get much out here. So again, I'm just thinking out loud here, everybody. So if we are looking forward to the process, would you be content with? Oh, sorry, can I ask? Yeah, go ahead, Brian. Yeah. I've lost focus, or I don't understand. 
So, I don't know this team either. Okay, mm -hmm. good. Yep. Mm -hmm. So you threw me off a little bit when you said different positions would be debated at town meeting. You, th you, were, you, were, you thought that might happen. Um, my understanding was we were just going to change the compensation table. Is that really what we're talking about? That the compensation table, instead of whatever the rate is for position one at ten fifty an hour, would be twelve or fifteen dollars an hour would be twenty dollars. Whatever. That that's really all we're updating. Or will there be other articles? Or do you anticipate? the way this is communicated to town meeting is through the individual department's budget, or both? So Mr. Chairman, every year town meeting votes two things. You're actually voting a chart that maps each position to a grade and step. Right. And then there's the second piece of it is the chart with all the numbers in it which is what is actually paid for the person in that grade and step. What I'm anticipating proposing, Mr. Chairman, is a complete rewrite of that. So many of the position titles might change a little bit. I'd like to move from having 10 steps and five grades, so that's what, 50 potential pay rates, and I move it down to maybe three grades and maybe only seven steps or eight steps, but instead of stopping at step 10, tie the step process back to a combination of merit and seniority and not just pedantically marching through the steps. So at, when this system was contemplated back when it was first put in place, it was a merit-based system. You got a step because you got a positive evaluation that justified you're getting more pay. And experience was part of that, but it was more than experience. You needed an eval. Surprise, surprise. Evals are difficult to do. They're time consuming. They can be conflictual. They were never done. And they can be never. And I'm not gonna I'm not gonna defend anybody for not doing it because I understand why it wasn't done, but it wasn't the system that was in place. But when the town passed or adopted the town administrator special act and made the town administrator the personnel director, a lot of that system became antiquated and too hard to implement. Because you had too many people who were too distant from the day-to-day -day operation trying to figure out, well, why are we evaluating somebody as good or not good at their job? And talk about conflict, there's definitely history in the record, the records of the town of how that wasn't working. So it got to the point where nobody wanted to be evaluated because they didn't want to go through the rigmarole of trying to explain to people what it is they do every day. So while I don't anticipate asking town meeting to review all the job descriptions, what I do want to be able to describe is the system. Why does the system have the grades that it has? I don't think you have five grades of clerk. We don't have that. We don't have a manual process anymore. Almost everybody who comes to work here interacts with the computer, usually custom software of some kind where they're entering data. Their accuracy is absolutely essential. If they make any mistakes, they mess everybody else up because it's all shared information. We don't have people, uh, typewriters or filing cabinets anymore. That just doesn't exist. So we have to find a way to recharacterize the jobs and then set salaries for the jobs as they exist that are competitive for people in other okay. communities. So that's one of the things I didn't understand. I thought we were just, just doing the rates and leaving the table the same. So if we're recreating the table, essentially, um, I do think we need at least one meeting just based on that. Okay. Um, I would agree. One that, meeting with who? I would say with Matt and the department heads. All? Yes. One meeting? And I would say we would, that doesn't mean they don't come in a second time for their department budget. But I think this, we're rechanging the whole way we pay the employees of the town. I think that's one meeting with all the stakeholders. And I'm not the one to decide who that is. My first impression would be the town administrator, the finance direction, and the department heads. But if there are others, you know, employees or whoever, it's an open meeting, right? Um, but that doesn't mean yeah, I, those don't come in for a second time. Now, if we do ask the department heads to come in a second time, I do think we need to, to limit the president, but we can't ask him to necessarily have a full presentation again. Hey, we're going to run out of meeting times. You know, maybe we have four department heads and it's 20 to 
25 minutes with each. And as somebody here suggested, they pass out their budget. We don't really listen to the, we actually offer, they can let us know what they think we might be interested in minute, but maybe instead of a 15 minute presentation, it's a three to four minute presentation, and then we, we ask questions. Um, one other question I have for Matt is, do you have an approximate value that you think of that this increased salary is going to come to the budget? I have a target number. Um, and target numbers can change, Mr. Chairman, depending on the overall financial picture. But for, for purposes of creating a placeholder, so I know what I'm planning around, I've set that dollar amount more or less equivalent to what would be a 7% goal. With, but don't get all tied up about it. All I did was say there's a target number in the budget for all of it. But what I would not be doing this year, and this is the reform does not require a COLA. So we would not have a COLA in this year's budget we would be simply doing the comp reform. So if you think about how this would work, if you might normally have supported a 2% or a 1.75%, which is a typical Douglas Cola, I'm using, I'd be using that money to go towards comp reform, and comp reform would be above and beyond that. So think of it as a four and a half or a five on top of the typical Cola. Do you have a dollar figure? Than the target is? So you know, that's close to a quarter of a million dollars. So the compensation reform, for all intents and purposes, is using the funds that the department heads would want for other projects. So nobody's going to get anything, basically. So, Mr. Chairman, the conversation becomes, are there things that department heads might ask for that in terms of their import to our service profile, both quantity and quality of service, would outweigh our compensation considerations? That's so the I conversation. The police department periodically needs a new cruiser. I don't remember when we got the last one, when the next one is due to be. So there's, it's a non-negotiable item. Okay. Cruisers, right? Because <clears throat> it's absolutely essential you can't run a police department without cruisers, period. Right. And we are up. They don't last forever. They get worn out really fast. So we need a new cruiser. I, I think our plan is to order two. Two. It's okay. two. Rebecca, so the that's fire in the budget. The needs the truck with the higher capacity for water. I don't no, so those are all capital expenditures. Okay, so so I, it's not my intent to expense any item. I'm okay. sure the chief would love to be able to expense a new cruiser, okay. a new fire chief vehicle. But I don't think, if writing my exam book today, I doubt he'd be able to come up with those funds based on what he's going to be able to get. Mm -hmm. uh, can I ask what our intent? Yeah. That answer question. So Matt, as an example, I think we got trying to figure out a little bit with Ryan, bear with me. Let's say a department last year had $500,000 in its budget, 60% of which went towards salary and 40% toward other. Are you suggesting that in the coming year, in FY24's budget, you're prepared to raise the 60% portion by 7%, keeping the other portion at one or 2%? and asking the department that if in that increase where they believe whether they need to cut a person because we can't tell one department to raise four percent on the compensation change and another department ten because hey we want to take care of our employees it's more important to us to obtain employees than the other department feels they want more stuff we need more retention we're going to use ten percent increase to salary compensation. That must be an across the board event, correct? On what the compensation adjustment per the new structural levels would be, correct? If it's seven, if it's 6.32, whatever it is, it's got to be uniform within your structural change of 
50 levels to 18, correct? So is that the analysis? Mr. Chairman, uh, close, okay. right? Some wrinkles. One is, the more recently we hired someone, the more likely it is that their salary is relatively competitive, right? So there may be departments where the adjustment won't be at the same level because it's a smaller gap. I get all of that. It, that's where I said you were the star. You're the one changing the 50 to 18, correct? Mm -hmm. And at some point, you'll give everybody, including us, that. And then a department chair would be faced with who they currently have within their department that fits that category, that one, that one, and that one. All of whom are going to expect a 7% increase, leaving that chair, that budget, that department head with less for other and having to decide, to decide whether they need more from the pot because they still need to keep all their people and need some more other. Is that what we're talking about? Whether we're going, going to give them more because they've properly explain to us why they need to keep all the bodies they have at those 7% increases within the new structure and why they need more other stuff. Or, right, department heads are going to be asked to decide, are they keeping the bodies with the 7% increases? Do they need another body? Or are they going to, because of the 7% increases and the drain on other stuff, are they willing to give up some other stuff? Yeah. I Am I closer? No, I actually think you got further away. Okay. <laughs> well, I don't know what the final answer is going to be. You, yeah. Your answer might be the final answer, yeah. my, but I know what my proposal is going to be. Okay. My proposal, first of all, is I don't really, uh, I regret even saying 7% now in yeah, answering yeah, the question whatever. because now that's going to become what people talk about. And granted, or guaranteed, there won't be a 7. There are going to be people who get a 14 and people who get a 2 but there probably won't be a seven, it, because that's not how it works. The average consumer does not exist. It was like the number one, I used to go into my marketing consulting engagements waving that flag. There is no such thing as the average consumer. If you market to that person, you will die. So it's, that's what we're dealing with here, is that we have some people who were hired recently, their positions are competitively compensated. We have some folks who've been here for 30 years, and the only motion they've had has been whatever was given by town meeting to the COLA, including those years when there was no COLA. But there's been no seniority, no longevity, nothing. So for some people, given the circumstances, especially those who have been here for a really long time in positions that are modestly compensated, those are going to be the departments where that's most likely to have the largest increase in their compensation budget. And to me, my recommendation is that is the number one priority. You have to do that and fix it so that the whole town can move forward and whatever is left is what will be left for expense accounts for anything that isn't already fixed, either an energy cost or anything else. So if your repair budget was $200 last year, it's probably going to be $200 this year. Because even though I'm giving your department another 450 bucks, putting it all towards compensation, and your expectation is you can still run the department with the same or slightly larger expense budget. So Matt is... Um, is that a better answer, a more clear answer? And you well, see the difficulty of doing it. <laughs> it runs up against, since I've been on the committee, I think my first battles were with school, and I wanted to raise money that went to fees, sports fees. And I was told categorically, you don't get to decide how the budget for that department is spent. You just get to decide how much you give to that department. And so you're suggesting we might back our way into it with some of these budgets. Right. Yeah, I mean, the, the school is different because we give them a number and it's up to the school board to decide how they divvy that up. That's not our conversation. They have their own, trust me. <laughs> it's really fun. Someday you can help me work with the spreadsheet. But, this, but 
I, I think there's a, you're missed, the, there's a step I want to remind you of, which is the personnel compensation system is a policy decision that will inform the budget. Yeah. It's not the other way around. Yeah. We don't give them a comp budget and then they try to fix it. No, every year we, we drive the compensation budget for the entire town based on what grade and step people are at and what color they're going to be given. Now when you say this table that is voted by town meeting every single year needs to change, you need to put some information into that bucket. You need to tell people this is how we want to change it and this is what the financial impact of that's going to be. So once again, the comp budget will be decided, if you will, by whether or not the personnel compensation charts are changed. What's Which it? drives the other? The charts drive the budget. Now, for your changing of the structure, are the department heads telling us how many they want in each structure and you are backfilling? Or you're telling if no, the department sorry. heads the new structure they're filled? I think if, Mr. Chairman, if you know me well enough, you know that I'm not a top-down kind of guy. I would rather build consensus. Okay. But in this particular instance, I see no other way to do it because of a few laws that have been passed, namely the Pay Equity Act. Yeah. Exactly. People in similar positions must make the same or roughly the same amount of money and have the same trajectory. So even if a clerk in one department is doing one kind of software and a clerk in the other department is doing a completely different kind of software, what matters in terms of the description of the skill set is you come to work every day, you turn on a computer and you interact with some form of custom software for your department. You've been That's the, Thank you. the leveler. Okay. Mr. Chairman, as we get into this a little further and questions appear in my head, I'm almost to the sense that we may need two meetings to go over this, one with Matt to present the initial, the initial proposal and to walk through that, and a second with the department heads to hear how that's going to affect them. That's just my, my thought as we're just starting the process without seeing any specifics. So, um, you know, one of the other things as a former chairman I might recommend is that you reserve the room for the 21st. I know a bunch of us don't want to meet four days in a row, but uh, four weeks in a row, but that you have that room reserved. So if it gets snow or exactly. that option is, because the selectmen are going to be in here on the 21st, we should at least reserve that room and with the opportunity to cancel if it's not needed. To me, it just kind of sounds like the compensation table is going to take the line share of the money, and that it is what it is. And like, but you've got you know the one thing that, that I see here though is you know when our department heads come in and everything, you know I don't think any of them have a padded budget. I think no. they, they we're very fortunate that they really work close to the bone and I think what I, I think is especially you know when they turn money in free cash you know and I, I think I, I was on another committee one time and all they kept saying was hurry up we got to spend this before the next before the end of the year or we won't get that much next year they were giving it away uh, and, our, and our people don't do that they run, they run a lean budget so I don't know where they're going to be able to squeeze it that's all if I may go ahead so, obviously, I'm on the school committee. Um, we did the compensation reform for the school committee side of it. We worked hand in hand with Matt. I think you need to have one meeting just to go sit with Matt, have Matt do the SharePoint so if we can get rid of the Zoom thing, however we do that, because that's critical. Understanding what he's trying to do and the recommendation for the compensation table is critical because that affects everything you do. Then you take in there and have the, each one of the committee people come in, present, but they also tell us like their top three priorities that they're going to have. What do they need? And then we are going to have some time spent hashing out and how to make it work. We're going to do like two or three or four rehashing of that compensation table just because I lived it. <laughs> but these are non-union, right. so that's the key piece point here is they're non-union employees. So you're not having to deal with the unions as you go forth with this. But having lived it, I know that we do an excellent job of communicating to both sides and the parties all know everybody deserves a fair and equitable wage. And at this point, 
some are compensated better than others. You just want to make sure you do right for the, the employees that do work here and come here every day because they provide a service to all of us. So, will we see like a job description or requirements for that grade or that? Yeah, and that's that's the hardest part of it, Mr. Chairman, um, Sandy. That's that's the real hard part because. <clears throat> So I've already done this piece of it, where it, and it was a while ago, but interviewing every single employee, <coughs> say, okay, this is what your job description says, but what do, you, what is the lion's share of your effort, and what are the skills required to do your job? So one thing we have done is we've rewritten just about every job description uh, between 2020 and now. There's a couple were done in 2018, but so we've. We've rolled over, turned over just about every position, so we've had to rewrite the job description to post it. And those that we haven't changed, there might be a couple of stragglers that need to be rewritten. But the jobs have changed a lot since they were last defined <coughs> in 2012. So, uh, <clears throat> so for instance, I mean, I'm hard pressed to tell you now the difference between an OA5 and an OA4. I really don't know. I just know that certain people are in those grades. I anticipate, well, one, one proposal I, I'm tossing around in my own mind is just to have three grades of office assistant, OA1, 2, and 3. One should, it's always easiest to define the highest level. Because you say, at what, pers uh, what point does a clerk stop being a clerk or an assistant and they start to have management responsibilities? Because that's your quote unquote <laughs> clerk of the works. You, want, you can describe that. It's getting to the other grades that can be, all right, what do I take away to create a pay grade that still reflects a job that somebody actually does? And then the, the bottom is always easiest, because that's your entry. So what are the minimum skills required to at least get through a day's work? It's however many grades you have in between the entry and the highest. You have to find a way to say there's a difference because that's the only reason why somebody would be paid differently. There has to be a difference. And so yes, you will see, you have to see, I think, to do, to, to be good decision makers, the chart that will have, um, management might be the easiest way to start to think about, it's actually harder to do. <laughs> but think about how many people do you manage? How big is your budget? Do you manage confidential information? So if, as you go down the checkbox, you know, your highway super is going to have one of the biggest teams, is going to have one of the biggest budgets. So it would stand the test of reason to say that's a level five manager because it's your outside of public safety, it's your biggest department, right? And then backing down from that and how many layers of that do you need? Um, because we run so lean, Douglas is a little bit odd in the sense that many of our departments, you have one manager and one staff person that, that there's just we don't I look at somebody recently I forget who it was I think it was the recreation department in the town of Foxborough it's like 22 people <laughs> there. I'm thinking to myself oh, 22 people are working town hall these people are running around yeah. keeping the parks and keeping the kids busy there's 22 of them so that's where we run into a little bit of trouble is that most of our assistants here have a very high level of responsibility and visibility into what goes on that in other towns that would be almost a management position but here it's you're the Indian so to speak. Can I ask approximately how many non-union non-contracted staff there are in all the departments combined? It gets sticky because you're part-time as well as full-time but full-time Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve, at least seventeen. Call it twenty one or twenty two. Twenty one or twenty two, including the part time? Yeah. Now, some of our part time staff. Their rate of pay is established on the comp table. So you'll have somebody who might, um, 
only work 19, 20 hours a week, but their rate of pay is an, is an OA4, right? So they're getting the same hourly rate as somebody who works 30, 33 hours a week. Can I ask you? Go ahead, Carol. On the compensation, I mean, now they get we steps. So I guess until you've been here about 20 years and you get to the max of 10. 10. Uh, so they get, they get the steps. Will they still be getting the steps? And will we get to this new compensation? So, so like every year, yeah, you know, in between the steps and a cola, you know, there were people who were probably getting, at some point I noticed, I, while I look at the salaries, we'll get like 12% a year change. Um, so that can happen as long as there are people who populate the steps and are making step changes. But once everybody gets to step 10, they're all at the top step. Um, <clears throat> I want to change this to directly tie it to loyalty to the town and, and experience. So it's hard to, for me to say it, but there are actually some things that happen in Rhode Island that are actually pretty good ideas. And just because the place is a, is a poop show doesn't mean that you can't take their good ideas from them. When I was a senior staffer on Governor Kachiri's staff, I thought the progression was perfect. You got paid a probationary wage when you get hired. Because for the first six months, we don't even know if we want to keep you. And we can dismiss you without cause. So for the first six months, you got paid like 90% of the full-time wage rate for that position. But once you got past probation, you got the step. So that call that step one. Then you would get a step at year two. Then you might wait until year three or year three and a half. And then five, and then 10, 15, 20. So you actually, this is where it gets interesting with the dynamic that we have in Douglas. We have a number of people who have worked here for 30 years. So think about how the math works. If I set step one for that position to be the salary I would have to pay to get someone to take that job, and then I build in steps all the way to step 30, that's where your money goes, right? So let's say each step, just pick a number out of the thin blue air is 2% because it's easy to do. Step 2, step 3, step 5, step 10, step 15, step 20, step 25, step 30. So a person who has been here for 30 years would get 8 steps above the entry level wage. And it gets complicated if the, what we're paying them right now isn't much higher than what it would cost me to get somebody to take their job when they retire. Much lower. Right? Right, so you're basically saying the wage you get right now at, as a 30 year employee is probably 16% off of where you should be in its system. Because I gotta hire somebody at the wage you're making right now just to get them in the door. That's where, that's where the money goes. It, it's pretty, it's not hard to figure out but, the positions I'm talking about if you understand how we're structured here. But doesn't it sometimes depend on the experience of the person walking in the door? Like, say somebody is less experienced, you would compensate them less than somebody who well, has the experience. You would have a basic, Mr. Chairman, you would have basic minimum requirements for somebody to get hired at all. Where experience comes in is whether you would stop them at step one, stop them at probation or step one or step five. Because if they're a lateral from another town, they had a responsible position they were probably making what your higher step people were making when they left that other town to come here. So you can't cut their pay to say, well, welcome to Douglas. You get, <laughs> your salary just got by 20%. 20, 20 not going to fly. OK. You have a question, Mike? Yeah, so I guess in that case, I mean, I get what you're saying, that there's certain basic minimum job requirements, right? Like, do you need a, a CDL license or something like that to even entertain that, that position? Um, but if you've got somebody like, you know, let's say we, we've talked about the position a couple times tonight, the town highway director, right? If you have somebody like that that retires from the eight from the town, leaves that position, 
what if you've got somebody, and again, this is a bit of a hypothetical, but somebody from a, a neighboring town or, or you know, worked in a situation where they didn't have that job, but they were on the cusp of stepping up into that role. So in other words, if they stayed with the town they're at, in a year or two, they're probably making that step up. If we took a chance on somebody like that and said, okay, you're gonna come in at step one, again, you wouldn't want to necessarily to, to kind of your point that right. you wouldn't want to necessarily pay them the current wage of your current director overseeing that that department. It's a little bit different for you know some of the 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 again the the CDL drivers, your plow truck operators, maybe some of your your you know data entry clerks that we talked about earlier because again those are more you've you've got to have a minimum skill set to even entertain that that person for that role. Um, but I think as you start to get somewhat into some of your more managerial, that's where I think it's not just time in the seat, it's, you know, what's the experience level of, of that person too. And yeah, I agree. I think what, what it, the interesting way it plays out sometimes, Mr. Chairman, is that if you have a number two, and I've worked very hard to make sure that all of our major departments have a number two, that there's at least some kind of transition plan. There should be enough of a gap between your number two, where if they aspire to number one, it would be a meaningful raise. But if number two didn't want the number one job and you had to go recruit number one from another town, you would have to find they're a way not, to make that competitive. They're not parallel. Right. You know, where so you, my boss is making the same thing as I am. Exactly. Yeah. Well, how's this for a strategy, everybody, that um, so Matt, when do you think you can be ready to show us a conform grid? Um, this is one of those projects where I would do better if I had a deadline, because left to my own devices. Well, for this instance, is you really won't be hard. Here, so. You won't be here on January 24, right? I, I would say if we could do that. The next meeting is is Valentine's the Day, which middle of February, yeah. But if we just say the 14th to show it to us, that's your deadline. Get it, you know. Well, most of you be able to be here on Valentine's Day? Yeah, I'm sure. I'm not getting the boyfriend. Wasn't there a massacre on Valentine's Day? <laughs> <laughs> Howard, we, you'll be out. You won't be here on the 14th, right? Then you know. Okay. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure I'll be married. <laughs> Can you get ready for the 14th, ma'am? I, I would it'd be much more likely to have a good result if I had a deadline. And then do we need to have that be our meeting? <laughs> yeah. So our whole meeting on the 14th will You've be? You've spent almost an hour on it tonight, yes, now I'll just an introduction. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think, I think and then, we spent more than an hour on it. And then also on our agenda, Matt, I just put SharePoint just to see how people are doing. But can any of what you're going to share with us on the 14th be already up on SharePoint so we can preview? Well, SharePoint is easy. The question is, um, where did we end off last year? Did we give everybody a town of Douglas email? I never got into SharePoint. I didn't either, i got to tell you. I didn't yeah, I, yeah. I'm not that From good. where, though? From, your, from a town of Douglas email or from your own email? From your well, Gmail or for me, email. but I can't remember. I remember getting the information and logging in, and I just couldn't get it. I, I couldn't yeah. either. I, couldn't. I don't remember the specifics. Of course, I give up easy on that stuff. Mm. I, I, shared I, mine. Yeah. I, I seem to recall that we did get you uh, an address because we, we, we pay money for them. So maybe what we should just do now that we have these visual aids here in this room is we will actually set you all up. We'll just take meeting time or we can be doing it in the background while the meeting's going on, but log in as you, follow the links, get you the access and then show you how it works. Because once you get into the rhythm of it, once you have your town email, you have access to our suite of right. things. You're just going to be able to find the SharePoint open it up and all the documents will be there. It makes our life way easier. And for those of you who care to watch the budget as it's being edited, you can I usually give a read only. Yeah. You managed to mess around with my budget last year. Well, I didn't change anything. <laughs> I just kept watching the, the red. Every time I would log in, I would say, Dick Vandenberg is editing this document. I was, <laughs> no way! <laughs> I, was, I was watching, man. I wasn't editing. <laughs>
I kept looking at red number get bigger. All the time. <laughs> it got bigger, then it got down to zero, didn't it? Yeah, uh, it did. Did you get on that ship? That's the only thing I would yeah. urge the committee not to do. I, I think Say this, again. I would urge the committee not to do the following. Okay. This is not the year to do that aspirational budget exercise. Okay. It really just doesn't make any sense. We know we're coming into it with limited resources. Yeah. Give, are you just giving somebody a noose to hang themselves with, if you'd say? So and I've got at least one person who keeps telling me they got cut, even though their budget went up. It's like, no, I cut what you asked for, but I, you still got more money than you did the year before, <laughs> just not as much as you wanted. Um, I don't want to get into that dialogue this yeah. year because I think it's unhealthy. So if we did kind of two-track thing, if we did on February 14, we'll devote the evening to Matt and the compensation reform, but at the same time, should we tell the department heads to have their budgets ready for us to read, mm -hmm. but then when they present to us, just keep it really limited to what, as you said, Heather, their top, three. Their top big three or something. Would that be okay and with limit them to, you know, you have 10 minutes to 10, 15 minutes, you know, and then, because again, our time is going to be devoted basically to that compensation. That's a huge chunk. you, you got to get through that. So if you get the copy of, say, the police budget beforehand, then you can always ask the chief a question, but he doesn't need to read out loud $55 for a holster, right? Ammunition is always there. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you want all the we've got a bar. in here on February 14th. Do you want them all not to be married? <laughs> <laughs> Matt, like for the 14th, is that, should that be you soloing or all the uh, people the, the, here? The disproportionate impact of this proposal will be the finance it's department. Not. On just I talking know, about just talking, talking about, about this, yeah. talking about right. this. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I don't think we should bring the department in. No, I agree. Department. No, I think the lion's share of it is it would affects the yeah. finance department, the highway department. Those it does both of those and I'm sure we'll have to have a conversation with the adult social center because it's a unique mm -hmm. function. But the 14th will just be you. Could be, yeah. Let's just do it that way. All right. Okay. Is that okay with everybody? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And I, to, to add to, Go ahead, Mike. to your point, not only for them to only highlight three important points, I think it's on all of us too yep. to not over scrutinize. Mm -hmm. You know, if trash removal went up five hundred dollars, I don't care. Yeah. I think we all shouldn't care. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you know? <laughs> let's not get into a half an hour dissertation yeah. on why cell phone went up two hundred dollars yeah. and trash removal five hundred bucks. Went up just yeah. I mean if it's you know. if it's minimal we need to have a de minimum. Why did you do white paint at the library, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, so we're going to move on through the agenda now, everybody, okay? So, can I, have we, have Gene, have Gene, we, Gene needs to know have we done call. three <laughs> I think we're still on three. I think we're still on two. Who will appear before us and when? No, we're, no we we're, talked about SharePoint. That's four. That's yeah. four. four. We we're we're up to number three. six. <laughs> we're up to number six. Okay. Oh. So, Gene, go ahead. Okay. This is, this is my take on the conversation. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. It sounds like we shouldn't meet on the 24th. <clears throat> what I propose shouldn't should not because the first agenda item is going to be the compensation schedule, and that'll be the 14th. Okay. If we can have the IT people here on the 24th, and we can maybe set you guys up and make sure everybody has access so that we can hit the ground running on Valentine's Day. I like that. Day. She's she's thinking ahead for us. So, so the 24th is just SharePoint meeting then. Bring your bring your well, laptop. So and, bring and, your and maybe, iPad. maybe it doesn't happen on the 24th. Maybe I can talk to the IT and maybe we can schedule you guys in at a convenient time for them and you. Um, so it, it happens like at the end of the business day, not necessarily at seven o'clock at night. Um, but I can, if that's, for those of you who haven't been able to get logged in, maybe we can schedule that with IT. So, so we don't need to come physically into the building on the 24th? Well, I'm suggesting that we hold that meeting, maybe how we can celebrate Valentine's Day on the 24th. And then we make sure we <laughs> motion to uh, February 14th, and then we can start with the compensation schedule. And then at that point, then we can start talking about the departments coming in. And we can open up the 14th to those employees that want to be here because I don't, you know, and you may have that opportunity but not necessarily have a mandatory meeting. 
for the department heads. We don't want to move to the 14th meeting until like maybe the 13th. No, or the 15th. Be Tuesday, so <laughs> okay. get that. So, Gene, are you saying we don't need to come in here on the 24th? No. I'm saying that I would like to schedule you with IT to make sure you're able to use SharePoint. It may not happen on the 24th, but I want you able to be logged in on the 14th. So, what are you saying, Heather? I'm saying we all come in, we bring our handy dandy, whatever device you use for SharePoint, we're going to use the 24th to do the SharePoint and to make sure everybody can use it. Okay. SharePoint is an easy thing to use. You can play around in there. Okay. How to use that? I mean, yeah, I, I guess I have to see if our IT person is able to come if, in. If we can. Yeah, if we can come. Yeah. You know, so maybe, we'll also do minutes that night. Maybe have an open house like six to eight and then you can start your meeting at seven and then because he's going to have to work with you individually to make sure that you're able to log in just the logistics of trying to yeah. get that done yeah. I, I think that's a good use of our time maybe could have a could they? Free help things a b c d well the other thing ahead of that i mean i'm sure i can probably get myself in i have not yet Perfect. but i don't have my login information if they were sent out you know if they could send out like an update that's you know right? on that and yeah i'll talk to it about that we can table so we can use it 14. yeah who we're scheduled. Gene, mm -hmm. if we wait till Feb 14, will that still give us sufficient time to start scheduling the department heads? I will put them on notice yeah. so that they know that they're going to be looking at the 28th through the Feb March 28th. So that month. Should and we if, plan tonight the school department night? That is typically I hold March 14th for some whatever reason. Maybe it's because I'm at UMass, yeah. but um, <laughs> it's usually yeah. the night they come. All right, March 14th for the schools. And we can send out the invitation to BBT for that night as well. Yes. I'm assuming you're going to want to meet with BBT. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, Gene, when you talk to the department heads, can you um, just remind them that we're not going to go over every line item verbally that we'd like to have it all in writing beforehand and and etc cetera, etc cetera. realistically if you have access to sharepoint you have it in writing already right the only thing you're missing is their narrative so maybe they come with those three things they want to highlight they're not going to be going through the salary budget you're going to have it because you're going to have it on sharepoint right so there's no need for them to produce a separate document other than their highlights and matt you can correct me if i'm wrong i agree yeah, I remember last year too going to SharePoint. I could see all that budget stuff on there. So. Because I, you know, but they'll have access <coughs> to that as well. The last thing you want them to do is produce a document that's different than what you're seeing on SharePoint. Right. Mm -hmm. So I would rather have it more narrative, so that you're addressing their, you know, what those top three things are in the department or what their challenges are in their department. So if if we take that approach, that through SharePoint, we can see all the details of the budget, and when the police chief is here, he can just give us a three point his high concerns, and we can churn through some people in the night, too, can't we? Right. And you won't be just two, de two departments in one evening. We could do four departments, maybe. You can do four departments. And, you know, and I know how, and I don't know what your schedules are like. If, whether the, you know, if nine is late for people, do you want to start at six? You know, that's. No, I, I'm okay with the seven. And, you know, it seems to me there are two dates left. And we, do we need to see more than six departments other than two school departments? Could we do a three and a three? Well, you may be able to do more than that is what I'm suggesting. Do we need to? Do you need to? Well, yes. it depends on, on the level that you want to go down. If you want just I, I police see. highway, Water. Last year we didn't catch in water sewer. Is that is that important to you? That's my question for for the uh, for the group. Yeah, for the committee. Would we go more than six deep outside of the school departments? Mr. Chairman, yeah. what's that? The, the one thing I I um, I've mentioned this in the past. I want to make sure everybody hears me say it again. I guess. The general fund budget is not the only budget. And the finance committee is going to review the enterprise funds and the financial integrity of water and sewer and the transfer station and pay some attention to these entities because if they run out of money, there's only one place they can go. So I, I think that for the first time in a long time, it might be good to actually hear 
a full-blown presentation from water, the water commissioners, wastewater commissioners, same people. Um, transfer station you can do in one night or, or not at all, but <clears throat> these these but these articles that get buried every year, we don't pay much attention to them. Those are the ones that can come back and bite you. Well, if we take, <clears throat> if we know that we're not going to have the fire chief for an hour and a half, but for 15 minutes, then we can maybe get through some of these that are more than 60 hours as, as, as we're so moved. So. Okay, the 28th, I would schedule 6, department 7, 720, 840, 820, or maybe. <laughs> you're quite <laughs> 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 well, You just have just, to be able to, for us to I, I, I hear you, Howard, but we're running out of dates really fast here. We can we're not start an extra date if we okay. think we go. I, I'm, I'm hard pressed to think we're going to go, with all respect to the 15 or 20 minute optimism, yeah. and I like it. Well, and Mike's point is it's really not on the, the person to come in with their budget limited to three. Mike is correct. It's up to the group to limit its inquiries mm -hmm. to the three. Right. Right. But each of us may have a different perception of what the important three items are, and that's 24 items for one department. Who's going to bring the music that they play at the Oscars when they try and pull the person off the stage? Yeah. Right? You know, that's you're, what we need. You've been fresh off Matt's discussion on Feb 14 of the compensation charts, and the first person on the 28th is going to get all of that put to the test. Well, I'll, well I, I didn't realize. I thought we were well doing well that in our meeting. Questions on the 28th. Bruce? But I think that we have, aside from you not being on, we have all been on the finance committee. We know these budgets. These are not Brian's new budgets. Brian's been on budgets. the finance committee in the past. Yeah. I mean, he, he took a break. Right, but I mean, historically, from last year, sure. there shouldn't yeah. be much growth there. It should be the same thing. So they should be able to articulate to us. I think it's our part to figure out how to limit, respectfully, the inquiries back to the person. And that's going to be a problem. But in my job, we can get things done in 15 minutes with a big group of people. So. OK. Any more There's discussion? A lot of pressure on Nickel. Yeah. On the schedule, yeah. <laughs> General Ben. <laughs> so, Gene, you're getting the vibe here? Well, <laughs> you know, to recap, 24th is SharePoint. I work with IT, try to schedule that. 7 o'clock, you're going to meet, you're going to approve the meeting minutes. Right. The 24th will be the compensation schedule, and we will invite department heads. Matt. The 14th, you mean? I'm sorry, the 14th. Yeah. And then the 28th, I can work with you on the schedule, Dick, after the, the 14th meeting. Okay. And then we can. I'll put the department heads on notice. Okay. But I'll also inform the department heads we're not looking to have them produce a detailed line budget because they, as well as you, will have access to SharePoint, so yep. we don't need to bring that with them. Mr. Chairman, I might recommend on the 28th you try to hit police, fire, uh, highway, and then the water group. At least you knock the big ones out, and then on the 14th there'd be smaller ones. Cool. The library. Yeah. library. The 14th school. is the school committee. 14th school. Yeah. Well, you know sorry. what? Library. library. You know, one of the things you said was, you know, we didn't think we needed the transfer, but I think that may be one we do because there's an the awful hot. lot of talk yes. going on mm. now yes. about the transfer station. Of course, the fees are going up and everything. And, and I understand why they're going up, but a lot of people don't understand. Don't understand, understand why yeah. Just on Facebook itself. It's, just it's on Facebook? Oh, well, and it's out there. <laughs> <laughs> Dynamic Douglas. Yeah, so, it's out Ryan's there. point on the 28th, you yeah. can run the three or four, three, maybe four bigger ones. By March 14, we may have a better idea of whether we need March 21. Because we still have five. Yep. We'll see on Feb 28 the dry run of whether we get through six or we get through two and a half. And just a reminder, you will have special articles. Water department, okay. library, senior just center. There. So you will have, you know, when you think of the special articles, you think of the community development. So you will have that department in here because of the special yeah, articles. Yeah, that's fine. And that it's more toward the March 28th. Correct. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, makes sense. Okay, any more comments or questions on the upcoming schedule? Just how we're going to do that. So we're going to. Um, hold off on meeting minutes until January 24. And I just put in your packets um, the bylaws about attendance. Okay. 
the key is if you're not going to be here to let me know, otherwise you're unexcused, believe it or not. You don't have to tell me why you're going to be gone, just let me know if you can't make it. And, um, but it's really important that we all try to come as best we can these next three months because it's just a busy time. So. Um, do we have any reserve funds? We do not, but this will be a recurring item on the agenda until the Springtown meeting. Okay. Anybody have anything? Can I make a suggestion that yes. we just approve our meeting minutes versus having us to go read them again second time in two weeks? So do it tonight? I would say do it tonight. I mean... Sure. Can, can people stay awake for 10 more minutes? Yep. All right. Let's do that. Sorry, I have one more quick question, Matt. Do we go ahead, Brian. Nice update or we still on? Well, we've spent a fair amount, but, but we are we still more. not right now. Okay, good. Thank Bye. you. Thanks, Matt. Thank you, Matt. Let's do June 21 first, everybody, if you could get those. Get out of last fiscal year. <coughs> this was where it was listed, all those dollar amounts for the annual town meeting, and we yep. hoped they were accurate, and then we did reorganization and uh, the schedule for the fall. Yep. So any... Uh, Problems with June 21, anybody? I make a motion to approve the June 21 meeting. Yes. So a motion made by Howard, seconded by Lynn. Any discussion? Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? I'll abstain. Brian abstains, okay. Okay, next is October 11. Carol, you were our, Stephanie rewrote it to remind everybody that Matt Benoit had said. Right, yep. right. Pre existing, right. right, conforming. Yep. Okay. Carol, do you want to make that motion? Okay, okay I'll make a motion to accept the October 11 minutes as written. Second. Okay, so Carol makes the motion. Heather, did you second it? Yes, I did. Okay, just any uh, discussion on the motion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. Okay, hang on a minute, you guys. All right, then the last one, uh, November 16, this was our little meeting right before the uh, Special town meeting. Yep. Any questions on that, anybody? Make a motion to approve the November 16 minutes as written. Okay, so Sandy moves that we accept. Second by? Second. Heather seconded. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? I abstain. Let us stay. I abstain. I will be Okay. Phil abstains. Yes, and then um, we're still missing the ones from October 25, which uh, I guess we're going to get those later. So, all right. Anything else, anybody? Okay, motion to adjourn by Lynn, seconded yep. by Heather, I think. Yep. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? We adjourn at 9.01. Second.